Uh, the Bible says in verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, and that's important, when God says above all, that's important, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I'm going to ask Brother Wayne if you would open us up in a word of prayer this morning as we jump into this. Amen, amen. All right. So what we're talking about is spiritual warfare. Now, um, you know, there's a couple things by way of introduction, I would say. Number one, if, if you're not saved, uh, you never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, um, really this is not going to make a whole lot of sense. And the reason for that is, as the Bible says, and I want you to look at this, look at John chapter number 8, John chapter number 8. Um, at, at our church, I like to do something that I, I find, I listen to sometimes preaching on the radio. Uh, I really enjoy Final Fight Bible Radio. I encourage you to listen to that. But every once in a while, I'll listen to some local stuff. And one thing that I've learned, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to try not to do too much Marco Rubio for you and just constantly check at this, okay, guys? But um, one thing I've learned is that a lot of churches don't necessarily... The other thing I've, I've... By the way, this is my ADD happening right now, okay? The political season. If you find me doing this today, you know, if you notice that pol politicians always use their hands like this, you know, it, it, because they're told you can't do this. Well, I'm going to do this, okay? Um, but um, anyways, I listen to some of these people on the radio, and sometimes what I find is that they don't always draw a distinction between saved and lost. Or, for example, spiritual and carnal. All right, so I, I, let me say it like this. If, if I'm preaching a message about salvation, I'm going to draw a very distinct line and say, you have either come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You've, you've been born again. You have placed your faith in what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary, and you are trusting in his righteousness alone plus nothing. You are either there or you're lost. Okay? Uh, the other one is this. And what I, what I hear in messages a lot of times is something like this. If you want to follow Jesus today, make that commitment today. Well, look, if you're, if you're lost, uh, before you can even follow Jesus, you have to be born again. Then you can follow Jesus, all right? You know what? As saved people, I've been saved almost a quarter of a century. You know what I'm learning to do after all that time? I'm still learning to follow him. So when someone gives an invitation that says, if you want to follow Jesus, make this commitment, that doesn't really tell the story. And so you've got people that are saved that go, I want to follow Jesus. And there's people that are lost that go, well, I do. But, but where does that put everybody at the end of the day? So let's draw a very distinct line. In John chapter number 8, Jesus Christ, uh, there's a lot of things that he says here, but one of the things that he does is he addresses the Pharisees. And the reason he does this is because um, they provoked him. And they basically said that um, he was a, a, I'm just going to say it like it is, they basically said he was a bastard. He was not uh, a virgin born. And, uh, and so they're attacking his, uh, who he is in, as God. And so he addresses that. And in verse number 44, he says this to religious people, get this, ye are of your father, What's the next two words? The devil. the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. Now we understand that's obviously not a reference to physicality. There's a spiritual context to this. And so if you're without Jesus Christ, the reason why there's no spiritual battle is because you still haven't been adopted into God's family. Once you get saved, you've got a, you got a target on, the, on your back. 
And your enemy wants to destroy your life because he sees you as a child that's been taken, ripped out of his family. He thought he was going to take you to hell with him. And when you got saved and you trusted the righteousness of Jesus Christ, God brought you into his family. And as a result, the devil doesn't like it. So there is what we call spiritual warfare. All right? Go back to Ephesians chapter number 6. So, again, if, if you're not saved, this, this may not make as much sense to you. But once you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, what you learn very quickly, as, as it says up here, there's a choice when it comes to spiritual warfare. Look at Ephesians 6. And look at verse number 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God. Now right there, before you get too far into anything else in this chapter, in this passage, you learn that there is a choice whether you put on the armor of God or you don't as a Christian. Paul's not writing lost people. He's writing saved believers. And he's saying there, put on the whole armor of God. Now, uh, we call that an imperative sentence. Someone is telling you something to do. When you say to your, your son, clean up the room, the implied person there is you clean up the room, right? When he says put on the whole armor of God, he's saying you put on the whole armor of God. So there's two choices there, whether you put it on or not, and secondly, whether you put on the whole armor of God or not. And look, I'm convinced some say people, they, they've got the Bible with them, they memorize scripture, but the sword of spirit, and we're going to get to that hopefully today, but that's not the only part of the armor. There's a lot of other components here, all right? So let's breeze through them real quickly, all right? Look, if you would, at verse number 11. I'm sorry, verse number uh, 13. He says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand. Look at verse 14. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Without truth, you have no way to keep on everything else that you have to keep on in your armor. He tells you that first. There's a reason for that. That is the foundation. There is a strong parallel between the person of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. There, there are people that will say, if you believe you have a perfect Bible, you are a bibliolater. That means you are making an idol out of the Bible. Let me tell you why that's a problem. All right? Do you believe Jesus Christ is perfect? Sinless? Okay. And, and he promised to preserve his words perfectly. All right? and, and the other thing is this. Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know what, what the Bible says? Jesus Christ says, thy, talking to God the Father, thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. There is a parallel between the, the person of Jesus Christ and the word of God. Jesus Christ, John chapter 1, is called the word of God. What do we call this book? What is this? This is the word of God. There is a strong connection between the two. I, I think as a Christian, for someone to say, I believe in a perfect Savior, but I don't necessarily believe I have a perfect Bible, you're shortchanging your Savior that you say is perfect. And understand that, that without that, look, if there's a doubt in my mind that there's something wrong in this book, guys, you know what I'd be doing right now? I'd be watching golf. I'd be out raking my yard. I wouldn't be in church, I'll tell you that much, let alone preaching this book. This is what keeps it all together. Without truth in your life, anything goes. Anything goes. Now, you understand, you talk to people that, uh, and I don't want to get into politics, I really don't, but there's a lot of things, uh, socially speaking, that are not acceptable that were not 50 years ago. And let me just give you one of those things, all right, without getting off on a tangent. Um, well, just gay marriage. All this about gay marriage. Now, let me tell you right now, before you start throwing stones or you say, don't get political or anything else, um, sorry, you cross into the Bible when you start talking about marriage. The Bible was here before the idea of gay marriage was, okay? And the Bible defines what marriage is. Now, for those that are, that are for it, let me just say this. I have a family member that's an immediate family member who professes to be a Christian and is a lesbian. So I'm not saying this because I hate these people. I want to see these people get saved, Okay. Uh, I'm not against them in the sense that well, I hate them, but I'm going to tell you right now, this stuff is wrong, and it's wicked, and it's destroying our society. Let me go on and say this. Those people would say it is wrong to support pedophilia. Do you agree with that? Yes. Even homosexual people would say, no, that's not right. Many of them. Do you understand what's already happening? I've been watching it on the Internet. They're already having movements for two things. They're having movements right now for uh, uh, polygamy to be accepted as love. 
and they're having movements right now to have pedophilia accepted as love. Now question, who are you to judge them without the Bible? Oh, it's just wrong. Tell me why. Show, try, to, try to tell, explain this to me. Well, scientifically, their brain... Look, you can try, but you know what you're going to find? You're going to find the same argument thrown in your face that I have thrown in mine when I say gay marriage is wrong. From their standpoint. Well, it's love. I mean, it, who are you to tell me? I, you know what the answer is? I am nobody. But the creator of the universe, he's somebody. Now, do you understand what I'm getting at? Without truth, you've got nothing. Without truth, it doesn't hold up any other part of your armor. And you've got to be convinced that this book is right, or you'll be a wishy-washy Christian. All right? So first thing there is you've got to have your loins girt about with truth. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, you know, men would wear these robes. And they, uh, you know, the, the difference back then was that a man would go into battle. And if a man would go into battle, you know what the Lord would tell the people to do? He'd tell the people to gird up thy loins like a man. So what they do is they take this thing and they'd, they'd uh, basically take their skirt, skirt, <laughs> all right, their robe, and they'd tie it back here and they'd do this thing and basically make shorts out of that robe. You know how they did it? They would gird up their loins. And when they did that, they were ready for battle. And they could run, all right? And, and they could run and they could fight, which they couldn't do when they were wearing their robes as normal. He tells them, gird up thy loins like a man. You know what the Lord tells us spiritually? Understand, when you are living in this world, we are behind enemy lines right now. This world is not our home. We are just passing through. And, and we are going somewhere else. This, but you know what the Lord did? He saved you, and he dropped you behind enemy lines. Look, if, if the idea of monasteries was biblical, really, you know what God would have done? He would have saved you, killed you, taken you home right away. But he left you in this world to make an influence on other people. And part of that is understanding you're in a battle. Gird up thy loins like men. So you do that. How do you do that? With truth. All right. We look down further in Ephesians chapter number 6. And uh, there in verse 14, he says, Stand therefore, having your loins gird about with truth. Now that's interesting. Understand the Christian life is not a, it is not a, uh, uh, oh, what am I looking for? It's not a passive thing. It's, it's not a sport just to be watched. A lot of Christians watch other people actually do something with their life for the Lord. And, you know, you'll see, for example, and I'm, I was really blessed by the Hoffman family being here last week. I'd love to support them. But you'll see a family like that go, man, isn't that great? Without realizing, the Lord wants you to do the same thing exact, right here where you're at. <laughs> you say, why? The Lord wants you involved. This is not just something to be observed and to be watched. It's not like when you're sitting down watching the football game and going, man, that's great. Woo! All right, you're supposed to be part of the game. <laughs> and you go, well, I didn't go to training. That's what this is for. That's what Sunday school is for. That's what church is for. That's what fellowship is for. As, as a, uh, a man's, uh, 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 what am I looking for here? Uh, so doth the man the, uh, uh, the countenance of his friend, as iron sharpeneth iron. All right? That's what this is about. And so as it relates to this being a participation sport, understand, it's put on, take unto, take on, take on. And, or, uh, and then he says, stand therefore, verse 14, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, won't, won't rehash everything, but the Bible tells us to follow after righteousness. This is a very important part of your body. You get hit here, especially right here, and you're probably a goner. And understand that the way the devil works is he doesn't just usually, he doesn't throw the kitchen sink at you all at one time. Usually he's just this attack here and this thing here and this thing here and this thing here. And this person's talking about you behind your back and you thought they were your friend. And your kid's gone wayward after you raised them right. And your family's sick and you can't get over sickness. And, and, and there's financial trouble here that you weren't expecting. And you can't seem to get victory over this sin. It's just a thing after, after another, one thing after another. And you have to learn to guard your heart. Your heart, without the influence of the Lord, is desperately wicked. The worst advice that a parent can give their child is follow your heart. You know what the Lord says? My son, give me thine heart. And let thine eyes observe my ways. See what the Lord wants? He wants your heart. The only way to protect it, <laughs> the only way to keep it, is to have a covering on it. 
And the Lord gives us a breastplate of righteousness, right? And that, that, phrase, that word righteousness is found 289 times in the Bible. It's the issue as it relates to salvation. You're saved today if you're saved because the righteousness of Jesus Christ, a sinless man, was put on your account. Isn't that a blessing? And your sin was put on his. And so he tells you, in light of who you are in me, cover yourself in righteousness. In other words, don't wait for temptation to come your way. You make up in your mind right away. Here's some things. And let me tell you something. They're going to be different for everybody. But I encourage you as families and, and as people, as Christians, have some standards in your life. Say, hey, look, there's some things that we're just not going to allow in our home. Because that leaves a back door open to the enemy. There's some things I'm not going to put in front of my eyes. There's some things I'm not going to think. Put that, put that on first. And, and as you do that, you are putting on a covering over your heart. Righteousness means purity of heart and rectitude of life. How many people could look at our lives as Christians and say, now there's some righteous living. Look, when you start talking like this, everybody automatically thinks of self-righteous Pharisees. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about you standing up and going, look at how great I'm living. Man, this person doesn't live as good as I. Look at me. That's not what I mean. What I'm talking about, though, is that you understand you serve a holy God. You serve a righteous God. And part of what should make up your character as a Christian is righteousness. There is nothing wrong with desiring holiness as a Christian. You need that as a covering. All right? Then he goes on, look if you would, at verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I won't spend too much time here. I'll simply say that you ought to be ready at any time to give an answer to every man the reason of the hope that lies within you. You should be ready. If, if you wake up in the morning and say, Lord, lead me to somebody that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ, that will change your day. It sort of sets the purpose on the front end. You're not just sort of waking up, you know, um, uh, throwing some cereal in your mouth, brushing your teeth, jumping in the shower, and running off to work. You're saying, Lord, wherever my feet take me, let the purpose be to give the gospel to somebody else. That will change how you live your life. And he tells you, you know what? That is part of your armor. Do you understand that? If you're a Christian and you are not taking the gospel of Jesus Christ with you wherever you go, you're not really living the Christian life. I didn't say you weren't saved. I, you could be saved and never tell anybody else about the greatest thing that ever happened to you. Now, I'm not the preacher. Some preachers would say, I don't think you're saved if you, could never, if you live your whole life and you never tell anybody else. Uh, sorry, I believe you could be. Because as people, we are intrinsically selfish. Amen. And it, and, and it takes something supernatural to get us to think about other people. All right? And you can resist the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. But if you yield to him, what you realize is, how many people could I talk to? This last week, I had purpose in the morning. Lord, give me someone to talk to. And I had a few opportunities here and there, but I was driving, and the, there was an accident on 225, so I had to go another way. And all of a sudden, I realized why the Lord... Now, look, I'm not saying God had the accident happen, so I'd have to go this other way or anything like that. I'm not that self-centered. I understand things happen in the world that have nothing to do with me. But I took it as something from the Lord. As Lord, I get it. There's an opportunity. I'm going to drive by a bunch of people, and I get it. So I pulled over, got out, started talking to people. Man, it was a blessing. I encourage you to do that. You say, why? Because our feet ought to be ready to go at any time. You know, part of the military is just that readiness. And if, as a soldier, as, as part of the military, you ought to be ready at any time to go where the commander-in-chief tells you. And your commander-in-chief as a Christian is the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, look down, if you would, at verse number 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And I, I want you to understand that the devil, like I said, he's not this guy in a red pajama suit. He's not a cartoon character. He's been doing this for a long time. He's been doing this longer than you and longer than me. He's been around for a while. And he knows what temptations to throw at God's people. And he'll, he knows what spiritual attacks to throw your way. And, and the thing is, uh, he, look at what he says there in verse 16. To quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You know what that tells me? The Lord is giving us what we need to not constantly succumb to the attacks of our enemy. 
And listen, if you attempt to live the Christian life, if you attempt to be a witness wherever you go, if you attempt to live by faith, if you attempt to, to man, I, I want to get admissions. I want to be a part of what's going on here. There is going to be attacks. It's on you to know they're coming. And it's on you to know God has given me everything I need to quench all. Do you believe every word of God? Do you? Because if you do, he says A-L-L. What does that mean? It means everything, all. The fire darts the wicked. And that shield of faith, that is something that God's given me. You know what that is? That is saying automatically, I believe God even when my circumstances say differently. I know God's word is true. God's promises are right. Devil, I'm not listening. And when those attacks come, you put up your faith. And you say, you know what, regardless of what I feel, my faith in what God says would lead me to stand and to fight on. Now, you know what I know about bullies? You punch a bully in the face and typically they back down, right? And uh, you see that on the global scene as well. You know, you see that with warfare as well. Some people, they only understand the language of force. And the devil is a bully. And that's why the Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. One of the ways you do that is by putting up that shield of faith. God has given you faith to have victory over sin. Faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, why faith? Why, does God, why is that the shield that God tells us to put up? Well, without faith, you can't please him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You are fighting an invisible enemy. So let's start with that. You have to believe that you're in a battle that you can't even see. That's the first thing. You have to believe that God is on your side, even when it doesn't feel like it. You have to believe God's promises are true, even when your circumstances lead you to think differently. That's called faith. And that's a big shield. <laughs> that shield, if you look at those Roman soldiers, those shields would oftentimes cover the entire body, and they would hide behind it. He would say, oh, you're just hiding behind your faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, you're just, you just got saved because you were scared of going to hell. Buck, 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 buck. Yeah. yeah, you got it. I'm okay with that. You can say that if you want. I'll hide behind my faith. You say, why? Because it hasn't been proven wrong, and it works pretty well. Amen. And uh, as it relates to this, understand this. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, I want you to think about this. Faith is believing what God says, or believing what God says, that is what invites faith. And doing what God says is what applies faith. All right? So there's two parts to this thing. One is a profession of belief. I believe it. Now, the way we, we try to explain this to someone that's lost, how many times have you taught someone about Jesus Christ? They go, oh, I believe in Jesus. You ever heard that? Understand the prepositional phrase in Acts chapter 13 is not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. What is it? Believe on. believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The devils believe in God and tremble. The wording in your Bible is very specific for a reason. One letter can make all the difference in the world. In and on. I versus O, right? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're explaining salvation to a lost person, you say this. Do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah, I, I, I believe in Jesus. You know, good man, good teacher, you know. Well, have you ever trusted him as your Savior? Are you placing your faith on him 100%? What do you mean by that? Well, I could sit here. This is the illustration we give all the time. I could sit here and say, that chair can hold me up. I know it can hold me up. That's the greatest chair ever made. It can bear my weight. It's a wonderful chair. I could talk to you about how great the chair is until I'm blue in the face. When will you believe what I'm talking about? <laughs> when I sit on the chair that I've been telling you to sit on, right? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith and using the shield of faith is twofold. It's believing what God says to the extent that you apply what he says to do about the things that he wrote about. So we say all the time, I believe God's word. I believe this is a perfect book. Yes, these are God's words. And yet when you refuse to apply it in the manner in which he says to apply it, you cut yourself short. And you, 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 you basically put aside a resource in your spiritual armory that God wants you to use, the shield of faith. All right, now, let's move on. Ephesians chapter number 6, look at verse number 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I, I, I wrestled with this idea of what the helmet of salvation was really about for a long time. But I believe I've got it. 
I believe I've got it, and I hope this is a blessing to you. Um, one of the things you have to do when you're looking in the Bible and studying the Bible is looking at other places where that phrase shows up. All right, we call that running cross-references, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Go to Isaiah. Go to the Old Testament. Isaiah 59. There's really only two other places where that helmet is mentioned, okay? One is in the Old Testament, and the other, the other secondary passage is in the New Testament. So we'll go to the Old Testament first, Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, and let's read verse uh, 16 and 17. And uh, down to verse 20, I suppose. All right. And it says, And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. Now we're going to, in a second here, figure out who this is talking about. But let's just keep reading for now. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate. Does this sound familiar? And an helmet of salvation upon his head. That's interesting. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay. Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands, he will repay recompense. Now, if you're a student of the word of God, there should be some red flags popping off in your mind right now. Because when you read about this, you're reading about someone that's coming to bring vengeance, and it specifically mentions the islands, all right, the nations of the earth. So in context, before we get too far, let's just make a healthy guess. This is probably talking about the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to establish his kingdom on the earth. We call that the second coming, the second advent. And there's two parts to it. There's the rapture of the church. Where the church goes up to glory, judgment seat of Christ, marriage supper of the Lamb, and then Jesus Christ, or sorry, the, the wedding, then Jesus Christ comes down and establishes his kingdom on the earth. All right, that is the second advent. And what you're reading about here is exactly that. Now look, just for further proof, look at verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, you read Revelation, you find out the devil tries to cast out a flood to drown the nation of Israel. And God opens up the earth and lets it uh, uh, go away so it doesn't consume the nation of Israel. Look at this. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. So what you're reading about here has a definite doctrinal prophetic tone to it as it relates to the tribulation and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 20. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion... And unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. All right, now I want you to go to Isaiah 63 just to further prove what I'm talking about here. To make sure we, we understand who this is. We're going to confirm that this is none other than the Lord himself. And, and by the way, this is the reason that um, when you talk about getting the world together, the United Nations, you know why they, don't, they can't accept the Bible? Because all this stuff. It talks about a king that's coming back to destroy everything they're trying to do, essentially. They're trying to bring the world together through peace, through flatteries, through a bunch of false covenants. And God looks at it and says, you're basically doing it to destroy my nation. So he comes back and sets things right. Now, look at Isaiah 63. Look at verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Look at verse 3. I have trodden the winepress with how many people? Alone. Remember back in Isaiah 59, he said he looked for a man and that he wondered that there was no man to do this with him. So what's happening back in Isaiah 59, looking at this passage here, is the Lord is looking for the faithful and he goes, look, I'm going to have to do it on my own. With my own righteousness. And in that passage, he mentions a breastplate of righteousness and a helmet of salvation. Look at verse 4 here, though. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury 
it upheld me. Now, that's a sight of God that a lot of people don't necessarily like or want to think about. But what you have to understand is God's been watching rape, murder, uh, thievery, and the rest of it for the last 6,000 plus years. So here we are, and the Lord's watched all this stuff, and you're expecting now, you watch it, and you go, justice, we got to put, you know, put that guy behind bars or capital punishment. The Lord's been watching it for 6,000 years, and he's going to make it all right someday. Now, why did I show you all of that? I wanted you to understand that the Lord himself, back in Isaiah 59, puts on the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation before he goes to battle. Now, don't you think if the Lord himself does that, it's not a good idea for you to do the same? Now, I want you to also consider this. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. What is this helmet connected with? Well, I think it's safe to say it's connected with the second coming of Jesus Christ. You read about there in Isaiah 59 and Isaiah 63. But here's another place. Look at Isaiah, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 8. Now, if you want to see the context, you look back at verses 1 and 2 that talk about the second coming of Jesus being as uh, him coming, uh, the day of the Lord being as a th- him coming as a thief in the night. Now, that is not a reference to the rapture. Because if it was just a reference to the rapture, guys, um, you have to understand the Lord doesn't come and take his own people as a thief. Here in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, um, you, ever, you ever heard of a bride? You know, guys, I'll tell you right now, brides are always looking forward to the wedding day. Probably more so, let's be honest, than the, the, the groom is like, he's looking forward to the honeymoon. He's looking forward to just having his wife. You know, the, the bride's like, oh, I don't want this color, and I want these decorations. She's thinking about the wedding day. That is the big thing. I remember when I was uh, engaged to Lacey, and I was in Pensacola. She was in Colorado getting everything ready for the wedding. And, uh, man, she would call me and tell me all this stuff that she was, you know, all this stuff that she was excited about. And, you know, I'm just thinking to myself, I just want to get this thing over with. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm being honest with you guys, okay? This may not sound spiritual, but if there's an honest man in this room, he will say amen, all right? And so I wasn't so excited about the wedding day. I was excited about just starting life with her. But, man, she was all about the wedding day. In other words, think about this. Do you think that the bride would be, like, basically taken away by a thief in the night for her wedding? No, that doesn't make any sense. There's a lot of planning. There's a lot of preparation. So when we talk about a thief in the night, that's when the Lord comes back to establish his kingdom on the earth and the world's not ready for him. Look at uh, verse number two. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they, that's the world, shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. As travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You reject Jesus Christ and the rapture happens today. Uh, you got a rude awakening coming your way. You say, what? Because it's no longer just going to be accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's going to be accept Him as your Savior, and you better not take the mark of the beast. And if you do stand up for Jesus Christ, you're going to get beheaded. You know how easy, easy it is to be a Christian today? Uh, imagine it then. Imagine it then. Now look at verse 5. Ye are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And that's the context of verse 8. So in other words, because we're children of the day, look what it says. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. All right, there's that righteousness, faith and love. And for an helmet, look at this, the hope of salvation. Now, if someone asks me if I'm saved, you know what I'm not going to say? I hope so. You know why? Because I know I'm saved. I know that spiritually speaking, and we'll look at this on Wednesday night, because I'm part of the body of Christ, I'm as good as being in heaven right now. We are seated together with him in heavenly places. That is, that is right now. You say, no, I'm not. I'm here. Well, you're there, <laughs> as far as God is concerned. All right? However, as it relates to your body, your body has not been saved yet. Right? Your body is still a sinful body. And you know what you're looking forward to? You are looking for the blessed hope in your life is the day when Jesus Christ comes to take his people home. The first part of that second coming. And you know what happens? You get a new body. You get a body that never craves chocolate again, ladies. Amen. 
All right, you get a, you get a buy that never uh, craves a cigarette, never craves a drink, never craves saying something that you really want to say, and just that zinger to get back to somebody when they hurt you, you know, uh, or saying something this way that you shouldn't say, you know, all the stuff that you struggle with in your body, you're gonna have a saved body. You don't have a saved body right now, but you will. And Romans chapter eight addresses that. He talks about that. Look at Romans chapter number eight. Romans chapter number eight. So that helmet of salvation is this. In light of where you're going, in light of who you're going to be, let your mind be covered. <laughs> let your mind be covered with the hope of your salvation. Looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. If you do that, man, that will change your outlook on the way you live everyday life. Are there not some places, are there not some things you've thought about, are there not some things that you have said that you're glad you didn't say at the moment of the rapture? Amen? Uh, aren't you glad? It's almost like the kid that got, gets caught with his hand in the cookie jar. I mean, there are some things and some places you wouldn't want to be when Jesus Christ calls you home. Sure. Right? And so if you learn to put that on as a covering over your head and what you think about, that'll change how you live the Christian life. Look at Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. And look at verse 23. And not only they, talking about creation, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Your soul's already been adopted into God's family, but your body has not. <laughs> you are waiting for that. Look at verse 24. For we are saved by what? Put on that helmet, the hope of salvation. We are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, the rapture, your body being changed, your body being saved, then do we with patience wait for it. So you know what happens? If you learn to think in light of the second coming of Jesus Christ, that will help you live a pure Christian life. Matter of fact, there's some great benefits uh, to having the helmet on. All right? Uh, how about this? Getting your eyes set in the right place. Looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. How about this? Set your affection on things above. You know how you do that? Have it on the helmet, the hope of your salvation. How about this? The purifying of your mind. Look at 1 John chapter number 3. Go with me to 1 John. Not, not the Gospel of John, but the first epistle of John. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 3. I'm sorry, look at verse 2 for context. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Are you saved this morning? All right, you know what you are? You are a son of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You know what you do right now? You don't see him as he is. You see through a, a veil. You see through a glass darkly. You, you see as much as you can about God through the word of God, but there's something separating you from the Lord. It's this body. And when you get a new body, you will see everything just like it is, including the Lord. And in light of that, look at verse 3. And every man that hath this, what's the next word? Hope. There you go. There's that helmet, the hope of salvation. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. I read a story about uh, a man that uh, was overseas in uh, Afghanistan. And uh, in uh, 2014, he was given uh, uh, an award for what he went through. Uh, this guy's name is Star uh, Staff Sergeant Ryan Fry. And uh, because of the, the helmet that he had on, all right, uh, it turned away a bullet that hit him square on the side of his head days before the birth of his daughter. He would have been dead, never seen his daughter, never known his, his you know, been, been there to raise his family. He's alive today, and he's living, and he's enjoying being a father. You know why? Because he had a helmet on. And I'll tell you right now, there are things spiritually that the devil is going to throw right here. How about this? No one at that church cares about me. God's not on my side. I don't believe God's word anymore. I, can't, I don't know if I can trust God's word. I think about, right? 
All those thoughts, how do you block that? You look to the end. You have to, as a Christian, understand that you're just passing through. This is just circumstances, okay, of this world. But eventually, you are called to something far greater in glory than what you can see right now. And if you'd learn to as a Christian, man, I, my hat goes off to these, these moms that are having these, these children. And uh, these days where, man, they're screaming, they're crying, they're sick, they're pooping, they're puking, they're all that stuff. Man, and it's all going on at one time. You're like, oh, Lord. Understand on those days, look to the end. Look to the end. All right, when you're as a Christian going through trials and sufferings and afflictions, learn to look to the end. You say how? Put on the helmet of salvation. You say, why does Jesus Christ do that? He knows what he's about to go do. And you are about to go and encounter a battle out there, Christian. Put on the helmet of salvation. Next week, we'll get into the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother James, if you would dismiss us.